when the pit is opened in Revelation chapter 9, and you have the smoke coming out as the smoke of a furnace, and then you have locusts coming out, something we're going to talk about in just a moment, then the king of the bottomless pit is released. And his name in Hebrew is Abaddon. In Greek it's Apollyon, but in Hebrew it's Abaddon. Avad means to destroy. And so that's why some translations render uh, Abaddon as destroyer. All right, so when the pit is opened, the destroyer is released. But what is the destroyer preceded by in Revelation 9? These, these entities, whatever the right word is, that are likened unto locusts. And I find that interesting because one of the things that the Creator brought against the land of Egypt as He judged the gods of Egypt in Exodus 10 were locusts. So, in Exodus 10, Moses goes to Pharaoh. I'll paraphrase for the sake of time. He says, if you don't let my people go, tomorrow I'm going to bring the locusts into your territory. And when I bring them into your territory, they're going to cover the land. It's going to be unlike anything you've ever seen. So, I, I don't think that there's anything superfluous in Scripture. There are, the words are there for a reason. And if he says he's going to bring locusts into the land, that means that up until that point in time, they weren't. He has to bring them f- from somewhere into that land. So, in Exodus 10, verse 12, this is what it says. The Lord said to Moses... Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt. Eat every herb of the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind on the land all that day, all that night. When it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And I'll just skip on down, and it just says that, verse 15, when they had finished covering the land, nothing green on the trees or on the plants of the field remained. So here's, here's where I'm going with this. Here we have a, a government and the chief executive of that government who says, I don't know the Lord. I don't know the God of Israel. I don't acknowledge His authority. Today, not just in this nation but across the world, we have leaders who don't know Him. Uh, who profess one thing, but their actions say otherwise. And mm-hmm. they, they don't recognize His authority. In fact, they defy His authority. Yeah. They say same-sex marriage is equivalent to what God has established. They say that if you think you're a, a woman, you can go in the lady. You know, all this bizarre stuff. They don't know Him, and they, they have hardened their hearts. So, to Pharaoh, he says, because of that, I'm going to bring locusts into your territory. And it's going to be an east wind that brings them. In Genesis chapter 41, we have a Torah portion called Miketz, which literally means at the end. And it picks up with the story of Joseph when he is in prison. And he has interpreted the dreams of the cupbearer who has gone back to Pharaoh, who has forgotten all about Joseph. And so two full years pass. And at the end, Miketz, of that two full years, Pharaoh had a dream, and I think everybody's familiar with that, but he sees the seven fat cows coming up out of the Nile, followed by the seven gaunt cows who swallow the healthy cows up. He wakes up, doesn't know what it means, goes back to sleep, and then he sees seven heads of grain coming up on one stalk. They're plump, they're fat, but then they're withered away. By, or they, they fall victim to the seven withered ears that have been scorched or blighted by an east wind. And so it's the same east wind that we, we can read about in Exodus 10. It's coming from the same direction. Some people interpret this east wind as being a levanter. It is a wind that comes from the Levant. It comes from east of Egypt. And if mm-hmm. you go east of Egypt, you know where you end up. Saudi Arabia. You end up in Saudi Arabia. Mm-hmm. So this wind seems to be coming from the direction of what we now call Saudi Arabia. And in the case of Joseph in his day, it was used to uh, prophesy of a seven year period of lack and want so, uh, so dramatic that people would forget about the days of plenty. That's what precipitated this seven years of lack. In Moses' day, it brings locusts into the land. It brings them into the territory. 
And so if the east wind originates in an area that we now call Saudi Arabia, I think that there is at least a possibility that the locust did as well. And so this wind brings the locusts into the land of Egypt, the most powerful nation then on earth, that nation that is holding God's people back. God causes these locusts to cover the land and destroy everything that the hail had left. Now, why is that important to us? Because it paints a picture of some of the things that are going on today as it relates to living in the age of redemption. So, I want to go to Judges chapter 6 and relate another story. In Judges 6, it begins by saying in verse 1, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And any time we read that, nothing good is going to follow. <laughs> so, they did evil yeah. in the sight of the Lord, and so the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, the strongholds which are in the mountains. And so they're hiding because of the Midianites. And so it was whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up, also Amalekites, and the people of the east would come up against them. So you've got these three bands of people coming against the Israelites because they've done evil in the sight of the Lord. And it tells us who they are, Midianites, Amalekites, descendants of Esau, and the people of the east. Now, where do the Midianites dwell? In the Arabian Peninsula. Where are the Amalekites? Where do they reside? Typically in what we now call the Arabian Peninsula. The people of the east, mm -hmm. I don't think that's talking about the, the Red Chinese or the North Koreans. It's talking about the people who lived east in areas, the, the Arabian Peninsula, the Middle East, perhaps Mesopotamia, that part of the world. And what are they doing? Every time Israel has sown in their fields, before Israel can reap their harvest, these three bands of people are coming in, and it says in verse 4, they would encamp against them, that is against Israel, destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza, and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. They are devouring, consuming, destroying every green thing, everything that would provide sustenance for Israel, just like the locusts did in Exodus 10. And then if we come over to the battle that occurs there when Gideon and his 300 engage these three bands of people, we can read that in chapter uh, 7, just before the battle, verse 12, it says, the Midianites, the Amalekites, all of the people of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts. I think some translations mm -hmm. render it grasshoppers. Grasshoppers, King James. Mm -hmm. But they are as numerous as locusts. And their mm -hmm. camels were without number as the sand by the seashore in multitude. So of all the things that these people, these invaders that are coming from the east, coming against those that have done evil in the sight of the Lord, of, of all the things that they could be likened to, the scripture likens them unto locusts, locusts mm -hmm. which remember locust-like entities, creatures, are what are released from that pit in Revelation chapter 9 in advance of the king of the bottomless pit, the destroyer being released. Now, the battle takes place and the, the enemies of Israel are destroyed, but there are a couple of their leaders that escape the battle, Zeba and Zalmunna. And so in chapter 8 of Judges, Gideon and a small group of people overtake them. And in verse 20 of chapter 8, Gideon said to Jether, his firstborn, rise and kill them. But the youth would not draw his sword, for he was afraid, because he was still a youth. And so Zeva and Zalmunna said to Gideon, rise yourself and kill us. For as a man is, so is his strength. And so Gideon arose and killed Zeba and Zalmunna and took the crescent ornaments that were on their camels' necks. So here's the picture we're trying to paint for people. They came from the region of Saudi Arabia, perhaps regions in Mesopotamia, and they're coming into the land of Israel to come against God's people. Why are they allowed to do that? Because God's people have done evil in the sight of the Lord. They have turned away from Him, from His instructions. So this is what He allows to happen. 
Remember, we said in a previous program that if God's people break covenant and turn their face away from Him, He turns His face away from them. He removes His presence. If He removes His presence, another presence comes in and fills the vacuum. And in a sense, that's what's happening. They've done evil in the sight of the Lord. He has delivered them into the hands of the Midianites, the Amalekites, the people of the East, who are likened unto locusts, who behave as locusts do in that they consume everything that is supposed to be sustenance for Israel. And just in case we haven't made the connection yet, when Gideon overtakes and kills these two princes, he removes crescent-shaped ornaments from their camel's necks. Mm-hmm. So I think anybody who's... who's Moon God <laughs> worshipers then, still to this very day. Right. Yeah. And so the connection is this, that those people are likened unto locusts. God brings locusts into the land of Egypt because the leader of Egypt has hardened his heart against God's purposes, where His people are concerned. There are still those of of God's people, presumably, who are more fearful of Pharaoh than they are of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, as He brings judgment upon the land of Egypt, He judges all the gods of Egypt, including Pharaoh, eventually. He's going to be destroyed in the sea. In Gideon's day, because the people of Israel did evil in the Lord's sight, He allowed these, quote-unquote, locusts, to come in and to devour the land. We see where they're coming from and and hopefully everybody sees the connection to what's going on in our world today with this, well let's put it this way, ISIS and and groups like that. All right, they make their base in the Levant, in Mm -hmm. in the Fertile Crescent, in Mesopotamia, present day Iraq, Syria, these places. But where are they reaching? How, what are they, what is the movement, what is the, the migration of their influence, which direction is it headed? It doesn't seem to be drifting toward the east. It seems to be coming from the east mm-hmm. and it's blowing west and it's coming across Europe and it's beginning, well, has been coming into the United States. And so we've not only got these Islamists attacking innocent people in Brussels and Paris and and in Germany, but we've we've got places like Orlando and San Bernardino and probably a host of other places in the United States that haven't Fort, even made Fort the Hood. news. Yeah, exactly. Fort Hood. Yeah. Um, the Islamic uh, a chaplain, you know, butchering right. uh, several people there. I guess it's it should be clear, but what I'm trying to suggest is one of the reasons we know we're living in the age of redemption is we see the locusts blowing toward the west. We see this invasion coming and its intent is to cover the entire land and to destroy and to chew and to consume. There's something in Hosea that needs to be mentioned here because we had talked about Hosea in several programs Mm -hmm. uh, several weeks ago. Mm -hmm. But in Hosea chapter 5, the Creator in speaking to His people, the house of Israel says in verse... Four, they do not direct their deeds toward turning to their God, for the spirit of harlotry is in their midst. This coexisting with these other philosophies, entertaining these other ideologies and mixing them with the truth. We've inherited lies. We've embraced these have-truths, which is nothing more than a lie. We, we now live in a day and time when not only does the culture get blue pump bumper stickers that say coexist and put them on the back of your car, but I can pull into a church parking lot and see the same bumper sticker next to a fish symbol. So mm-hmm. the spirit of harlotry, he says, is among them and they do not know the Lord. So he, he is addressing the fact that they are willing to coexist with all these other ideas and philosophies. And so then in chapter 13 of Hosea, as a consequence of that, to a backslidden people, he says this in verse 15, though he is fruitful among his brethren, an east wind shall come. The wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness. Then his spring shall become dry and his fountain shall be dried up. So an east wind factors heavily into what happens in Pharaoh's dream. 
It brings about a time of seven years of lack and that's unprecedented in his day. It's an east wind that brings the locust into the land of Egypt in Exodus 10 because of Pharaoh's hardened heart. And in Hosea, because his people are backslidden, they have the spirit of harlotry among them, an east wind is going to blow. What is it going to bring? If we turn the page, I'm of the opinion that Joel gives the answer. Because in chapter 1, he says this. He says, Hear you elders, give ear all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or even in the days of your fathers? And then he goes on to describe what's about to happen. Verse 4, what the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. The swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. What the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. And so from there he goes on to say, awake, you're, you're drunk, you've passed out, you're, you're asleep. You have no idea what's getting ready to happen. Mm-hmm. And in chapter 2, he says, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Why? Because the day of the Lord is at hand, it is coming, a day of gloominess and darkness, thick clouds and darkness. And a people are coming, great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. And he goes on and and talks about how the land before them is like the Garden of Eden, behind them a desolate wilderness. Now, I realize that the prophecy in Joel is referring specifically to the land of Israel. But I want to just entertain the possibility that the principles and concepts can be applied anywhere where God's people are. If God's people are in this nation, for instance, and we, as we've discussed earlier, have turned our face away from Him, if as a nation we've turned our face away from Him, if we were in covenant with Him, would He allow some of the same consequence to befall us? In fact, would he be so specific as to allow an invasion of locusts, so to speak, that are going to come to chew, devour, destroy, and consume? Uh, The army that's going to come into the land of Israel before them, it is like the Garden of Eden. Behind them, it is a smoking, desolate wasteland. And if not for the act of the Almighty who steps in, there is no hope for the salvation of Israel. It would be completely obliterated from the earth. Zechariah speaks of this in the 12th chapter, verses 2 and following. I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against this. And, and, and from this, Bill, I, I look at this situation that, that results in, uh, in Joel, in, in that invasion that, that transpires. Uh, it's a smoking, desolate wasteland, and it is that, that invasion that causes the atmospheric event of the sun being darkened, the moon turning to mm-hmm. blood. That's a, a blood moon. Every incident of blood moon in the Bible is referring to that very incident, which is an atmospheric event. It is not a, um, it, it's not an eclipse. An eclipse is a sign in the heaven. But mm-hmm. this is speaking of the atmospheric event uh, that is a result of this horrendous war. And, and I've always looked at that is that all those who burden themselves with Israel. And uh, the United States is about the only one that stands with Israel at this time. At this time. At this time. But even our congressman, uh, uh, just just this uh, two weeks ago, was telling telling, uh, Netanyahu to tell the President of the United States uh, to do something that I can't repeat on the air, especially on Christian television, okay. but uh, but but there is um, th- those who would want to stand with Israel and support Israel are are now being castigated. It, it looks like everything that is being done from uh, the, the president bowing to Muslim kings and princes around the world, which is it is literally an act of treason. You know, I, I worked for the U.S. State Department. I was in the uh, Marine Security Guard Battalion, and we learned the protocols of what you do and what you do not do. And if a, a private in the Marine Corps had bowed to a Muslim prince or dipped the American flag, they would be in prison. 
mm. for doing what Obama did. This is what we are trained to do. We knew how, uh, exactly what the protocols were. Uh, you know, we were instructed that the President of the United States will never kiss the Pope's ring will never bow to another dignitary uh, of any other nation because we stand as sovereign upon the planet. But yet, that is what our president did. While President Obama didn't kiss the guy, he did seem to bow. Look at that. But the White House says, no, 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 no. You saw it, you make the call. Bowing to Muslim princes in everything that he's done has been bowing to the eastern hordes, the locust, uh, which is now all, all set up. And, uh, you know, it looked like uh, ISIS came out of nowhere, but they really didn't. Because when the United States, um, against all of the military advisors of President Obama, said, do not tell them when we're leaving... You know, mm -hmm. but yet he announced when we were leaving, and then what did he leave behind? 2,300 fully equipped Hummers, home vehicles, 50 caliber machine guns, and that is, they were completely outfitted uh, to, to do battle and, and to wipe everything out. He completely outfitted ISIS to do what they are doing right now. We more or less created them. Oh, we, 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 we created them, absolutely. They, yes. You know, they, they'd be on a camel. <laughs> they'd, be, they'd be jumping across the desert on camels, you know, you know still, still herding sheep, okay? But no, 2,300, 2,300. You have any idea the value of that? Yeah. And, and, and so now recently he said, well, we have to let the other Muslims, uh, you know, take care of them. The new graduates from the $500 million program intended to train 5,000 moderate rebels to fight the Islamic State and the Syrian government of Bashar al-Assad betrayed the United States government about five minutes after crossing the border from Turkey into Syria Monday night. Multiple reports say that the 75 new trainees of Division 30 immediately surrendered and handed their weapons to al-Qaeda's affiliate in Syria, the Nusra Front. They promptly pledged allegiance to al-Qaeda. Division 30's commander, Anas Ibrahim Obaid, reportedly told the leaders of the Nusra Front that he tricked his American handlers because he needed weapons. The Nusra Front thus gets what is described as a very large amount of ammunition, machine guns, and about a dozen new pickup trucks. Over the weekend, the chief of staff of Division 30 in Turkey quit, saying that the training program was not serious, that there was a lack of trainees, fighters, and supplies, and that the process for vetting new soldiers was poor, obviously. Last week, Army General Lloyd Austin, head of U.S. Central Command, told the Armed Services Committee of the United States Senate that the original group of Division 30 fighters who crossed into Syria last month, uh, of that group, only four or five are still fighting. So for the record, this program that was supposed to yield 5,000 soldiers to fight against Bashar al-Assad has yielded five at a cost of $100 million per man. It's, you know, the ones that they didn't give 2,300 Hummers to. It would, it would almost make you believe in conspiracies, wouldn't it? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, no doubt. This, this is what was planned, but we're seeing that what you have been painting a picture of and, you know, just where these, where they're coming from, you know, this ensample, this example mm -hmm. that we see over and over and over, it is telling us something that we see going on right now, and there is no way that, that you can deny that. Well, it's, it's more than a coincidence, is what uh, I'm saying. Absolutely. You know, a few things that popped in my mind while you were talking, and, and we've said it several times now, is that if the presence of the Creator is removed from a situation, that opens the door for another presence to come in, and it will not have the best interests of God's people in mind. Now, mm -hmm. I, I want to choose these words very carefully. I, I don't want it to be misconstrued as saying what I'm not. But if there has been a time when the Almighty has been welcome in this nation, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of fine tune it a little bit, uh, He's been welcome in the people's house, the seat of government. But now He has been pushed out, asked to leave, or he's just departed. Mm -hmm. For example, well, the, well, uh, well. The, the monument that we're building in Oklahoma, 
You know, if they had the statue of the Ten Commandments sitting right there. If I said, you know, hey, let's put up a statue of Baphomet, or oh, you can't do that, you know, that's just evil. Well, well no, actually, we can because now we're religious. Now you can't deny us. Do that where you live at. Why don't you do that where you live at? How about you just oh, do it in your own little because personal the problem is they didn't build they didn't build a Ten Commandments monument outside of my state capital. Then another presence has come in. Another mindset has come in. In First Samuel, chapter two, believe it is. When the unnamed prophet goes to Eli, the high priest, he says, the end of your days are at hand. I'm going to kill your sons, Hophni and Pincus. And when I've gotten through with you, you will see an enemy in my dwelling place. Interestingly, the word enemy or foe there is czar. Then it became more confusing. Suddenly, the Russians intervened. President Putin sent hundreds of planes and combat troops to support Assad. But no one knew what their underlying aim was. They seemed to be using a strategy that Vladislav Surkov had developed in the Ukraine. He called it non-linear warfare. It was a new kind of war, where you never know what the enemy are really up to. Allah. The underlying aim, Surkov said, was not to win the war, but to use the conflict to create a constant state of destabilized perception in order to manage and control. You will see a czar in my dwelling place. All right, but what is he saying? I'm not there, so another presence is going to be there, and you're not going to like what this one has to do. You're not going to like it. So uh, going back to what's going on in our nation. Uh, I, I'm certainly not going to pretend that every president that is, has been before has been a man of God. You may remember back in 2005, President Bush kissed Crown Prince Abdullah of Saudi Arabia and then held his hand. I thought it was Paul and Paul, remember them? I, I, I'm not that naive, but I think as a nation, we have, up until a certain point, certainly wanted God to dwell with us. He's, mm -hmm. We've wanted him to, to abide with us. We've wanted to honor him, even with all of our warts and flaws. But now things have become blatantly against God, against his word, against Israel, mm -hmm. and in deference to those who, would, who want to destroy God's people, those who want to destroy God's people. And so this wave that is... Um, emanating from the east in the Middle East and in Mesopotamia and Iraq and Syria and, and Saudi Arabia, as it moves west, it's, there are those that almost invite it. Mm. Yeah. They welcome yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because it is a reflection of the state of affairs in the hearts of God's people. What goes on in politics, what goes on on the national scene is to some degree a reflection of what is going on in our hearts. Because if that were not so, he would have said, if those people who don't believe in me, who don't think I exist, if they would humble themselves, seek my face and pray, etc. But he doesn't say that. He says, if my people, if they would humble themselves, seek my face and pray, turn from their wicked ways, then he will hear, then he will forgive, then he will heal their land. So what, what Joel describes is an army of invaders that, yes, specifically are coming against the land of Israel. I'm just one of those that believe that we can exact from that a concept that if he's going to allow this to happen in the land of Israel or warn the inhabitants of Israel that this is about to happen, then the warning would be applicable to wherever his people are. If well, gonna... we, we have seen the uh, the repercussions of this Islamic invasion first in in uh, Europe, which has really, as far as the church is concerned, has really gone far away from God yeah, and, and left much yes. earlier than than America has. Yes, and so now we're seeing that invasion happen there. Now we're seeing the doors open wide open for all sorts of evil to continue to breed in America at this point, and there, there's no stopping it. So this, well, ex exactly, and it makes me wonder if there is that kind of a, a that level of a uh, of threat to our lifestyle. What would people be willing to compromise in order to 
make peace or to to coexist or to even have a ceasefire? What would they be willing to compromise? What would they be willing to to abandon and walk away from? And and to some degree, to me, it seems that's already happening. We're embracing, or the country, I should say, is embracing um, the idea that this. Islam is a religion of peace, and at the same time, disdain <laughs> right, and castigate it. this book and everything right, it stands right. for. Yeah. Christians are the problem, and Islam is a religion of peace. Yeah, well, as I understand it, they are a religion of peace when the world has become Islamic. <laughs> that's when right, they're when a religion of peace. Everyone submits. I right. mean, that's, that's the point. You have to submit because they're. Uh, the, the whole base of the religion uh, to prove that their God is superior, that he is greater, is, is that everyone is subservient and has to be under their rule, their yes. rule of law, and, uh, you know, if, if, not, uh, if not dead, uh, paying tax and, uh, and submitting to their rule of law. And here we, we, we live according to the Constitution, and Sharia law is, uh, you know, it's, it's a joke. Well, it's a man-made laws from hell. This is what's happening. This east wow. wind is blowing. Incredible. So it's happening. Now, what do we take away from this? Why is this important to me? Uh, you know, as a, as a young believer, I remember there's a song we used to sing in church. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Based, right, uh, right uh, what we read Joel. here. We used to think, or at least I used to think, that the army that we were celebrating and singing about, this army that they, they march, march on the city, they run on the wall, great is the army that carries out his work. I used to think that we were that army. <laughs> right, right, right. And, and then I started reading that actually what we were celebrating was an army of locusts that is coming against us because we right. are asleep, we are like drunkards, and we need to be awakened from our slumber. And, and he goes on and even says very plainly in verse 25, he talks about my great army which I've sent amongst you. So when it gets right down to it, what's happening, Michael, is not, it, it's not necessarily that this politician's doing it or this party's doing this or this group of people's doing that. What we're seeing going on is a consequence at large of where God's people are in relation mm -hmm. to what he's saying to them and what he's wanting to do in the earth. And is he has it not a way. he who is bringing on this judgment because of where God's people are at? Absolutely. It is. It's hard to, uh, hard to say that, but just as it speaks of, si uh, of uh, Isaiah, being of Cyrus, I create good and evil. I mean, the evil that is, uh, you know, Cyrus just wiping out everyone with his ability to do so, yet that was of the Almighty. He was the one that empowered that, and judgment was brought because the Almighty is in charge of the universe. We, we, it's, hard to, it's hard for us to reconcile why the Creator would allow something like this. Why would this be His army? Well, if He's going to break something down, whether it be an institution, a nation, what have you, it, it's, the destruction is not the goal. It's to break something down to build something up. If He's going to cause a nation or nations to decrease, it's because He's restoring a nation. He's building mm -hmm. up Zion. And so if he brings this army against a nation, the nations, it's just another way he has of pointing his people to look. Those things that you've placed your confidence in, those other nations, those other gods, those other things, they're all coming to an end. And so now is the time for you to begin to search for me, seek me with all your heart. And, and let me read this and then I'll pause. That's why in Joel 2, I believe he says this. He, he's describing how destructive this army of locusts is. And by the way, he, he makes it clear in verse 7 that you cannot build a wall expecting to keep these people out. They climb over the wall. Mm -hmm. So just for what it's worth. But then he says this in verse 12. Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, rend your heart and not your garments, and return to the Lord your God. He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent? 
So it's clear to me that he's saying, yes, this is what's getting ready to happen, or this is what's happening, but here's why, and here's, the, here's what I'm provoking you to do. Turn back to me with everything you've got within you. Turn away from all these other things, all these idols of Egypt, all the abominations. Turn to me with your whole heart. And if we do that, verse 25, he says this, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. And he goes on and says, verse 20, 28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, etc. I will pour out my spirit on you in those days. That's what he desires to do. In those days, do. and it's after that invasion. It yes. is after the Almighty turns them into a, a, a stench in his nostril. Their, the, the reek of the rotting carcasses reaches up into heaven. Well, and we could couple that with what it says in Ezekiel 36, when he is bringing them out of the nations, where they have profaned his name, he says, They're bringing them, he's bringing them out of the nations into their own land. That's when he replaces that heart of stone with a heart of flesh. And he says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, observe my judgments and do them. So his spirit is being poured out upon his people mm -hmm. because he is restoring the kingdom. He's, right, right. he's eliminating all of these other nations and kingdoms and kings and potentates so that his people come to abide in a place where there's only one king and his name is one.